Yeah, welcome to this video. Yeah, this is something that I haven't done for a while, a book review. Yeah, and um, recently when I did those live streams for ICC, I sometimes got questions, what kind of books can you recommend? Sometimes it was a specific question, what is your favorite book, things like that, but also <clears throat> is there a book that recently was released that you were impressed with? And I think I mentioned more than one time, I mentioned this new book by um, Victor Bologan, Bologan's Black Weapons. Yeah, In the Open Games is the complete title, Bologan's Black Weapons in the Open Games. How to play for a win if white avoids the Rui Lopez. So this is a black repertoire book for players who answer e4 with 1e5, double king pawn. If you know my videos, my blitz games, you know that 1e5 is my main move against e4. And um, yeah, I have to deal with those things. So this is a book that definitely interests me. Uh, personally, and I was really impressed with it. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about this book. If you intend to play 1e4, 1e5 as black, or you already do and feel like your repertoire needs some refreshing, some updates, or simply some more solid ground, then this book is definitely um, for you to get. I'm here on the New and Chess website, which is, uh, New and Chess is a publisher for this book. And um, this is also where I recommend uh, to go um, to, to look at those sample pages. Yeah, what I will do now, I will show you some sample pages of this book. I mean, I, I got it, I got it myself, but <laughs> some sample pages to for you to get an impression. You can, of course, go to the website and do this yourself. So let's have a look at uh, those sample pages. The sample pages are the, um, yeah, the contents. And I will show you some things, uh, some things later. And I also give you an overview about the repertoire presented when we actually will put up a chessboard and I will show you some lines. But it is a very comprehensive overview. If you see, and look at the page count, 300, 380, 400, 400 something, and it ends with 500 something uh, pages. So it's a 500 page thick book. It's really quite quite massive this book mm -hmm. yeah and um, it's really really nicely done why is it um, such a yeah, massive book the reason is that Bologan didn't present just one line against every main uh, system but m more more than more often than not he presents two or even three options for black and this is i think a good thing because it's not like every option is the right one for every occasion or for every player sometimes you rather prefer a somewhat calm game sometimes you want to sharpen it up or sometimes you really want to avoid any theoretical workload and he tries to do that for every variation the book also contains something that i really like Okay, we have an introduction, yeah, and lots of interesting information, but it also, yeah, it, here it gives an overview about um, how the book is structured. I can also, I can show you right here, actually. What um, is the book doing? There are many interesting things. Have a look here. This is one thing that is very interesting. There are game references, not in the text, but done with those little... Um, small numbers here, references, and at the end of each chapter you get a get a list of all the reference games. This is something that is a matter of taste, but I think it's an interesting approach. So there is no nothing in the in, in the in the text like this was played in game so and so, but in game seven, and then you have to look it up what what game seven actually means. Sometimes this is um, a bit annoying that you have to switch to the to the appendix, but it makes the whole thing a little bit more readable. It's it's an interesting approach. Um, I, for once, I'm not so interested in who actually played those those games. I can look this up in the database. I'm more interested about the author's opinion about a certain move um, or line. He also has this kind of thing, where if you have a reference number with a the square around, then it's a new move. So interesting, it also shows alternatives, like here's an alternative or here's an alternative. Um, every chapter, but uh, this we probably should uh, do with an example. Here, this is also very interesting. 
he has uh, two approaches for the chapters, the fast lane and the very fast lane. This is interesting. <laughs> yeah, so every chapter has a sort of a summary where he says, okay, the very fast lane means you want to look at this line. What is the most essential thing that you look at first? So if you really have little time on your hands and you want to get an idea of what's happening in a specific line, then the very fast lane is where to start. There's also the fast lane, which is a little bit more comprehensive, a little bit longer and takes more time to learn. But it's a nice way to, to summarize the, 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 these chapters and uh, make it easier to access. I think it's a, it's a quite good idea to do that. Um, yeah, gambits, a couple of gambits. And um, then a very, very nice feature of this book, the arsenal of strategic ideas and themes. We can look at this, how it looks like. This is the arsenal. And um, yeah, what he does is he shows on about 30 to 40 pages, I think, um, he gives an overview about central pawn structures, ideas, yeah, what happens in what structure, what are the ideas, what are the pawn breaks, or, or piece maneuvers, yeah, how are pieces placed, and so on. A very interesting overview. Um, and it is, um, it is doing one thing. Those things are also mentioned in the, in the actual chapters, but it does one interesting thing. Um, let me give you an example. Here, something like that. He attaches certain names to structures. Sometimes those names are well known, sometimes they're not. This, for example, the Nimzo Nightmare is a very, very funny name. Uh, Bologan calls this structure here the Nimzo Nightmare. Um, I don't want to get into details why it should be a nightmare or whatever, but it's very interesting. If you attach those kind of catchy names to certain structures, it helps you to. Um, to um, to remember the features, yeah. The Nimzo nightmare is something that sticks into your mind, and maybe it helps you to avoid this position. He says that, for example, some of those structures are a little bit problematic for black. Mm -hmm. Depends on certain features of the position, and this is why nightmare and so on. And this helps you to to remember things better if you have a name attached to it. I also learned that. Um, the my favorite move queen h4 i have to look it up queen h4 in the open games has a has a name actually <laughs> let me have a look i have to i'm really curious now what the, what the name was i forgot it actually ah, where is it it has a funny name staunton's queen yeah staunton's queen queen h4 is staunton's queen yeah so this is what I was talking about. He gives a good overview about uh, strategic features of the position. Yeah, this is how a normal chapter looks like. It starts with the fast lane. And this is really a pra pragmatic approach. It's very interesting. Here, for example, we have um, something about uh, the rare third moves, which means the very offbeat stuff that white can do on move three. If you look at this here in this diagram, this is the stuff like d3 or b3 or bishop e2. And what he says is, save your energy and go to the next chapter. You rarely see these openings. Um, um, yeah, it, it won't happen that often, Yeah, this kind of opening, and it's not very dangerous. This is a good information, you know. Frankly speaking, I never looked at 3, bishop e2 or d3. Why should you? You can just develop your pieces. So. It is good to have an overview because there are some ideas related to those moves, but really it's not theoretically very critical. So skip your energy. Good advice. Let's scroll a little bit more. It's, uh, it's this chapter is here. And here this is good. At the end of each chapter, gives an overview about the traps. There, and there are often traps related to openings, even some openings that are not that dangerous, but there might be a little trap in there. So. He warns you about those. He gives you information about transpositions and move orders. Yeah, uh, Here it's not that tricky, but sometimes move order is important. In e4, e5 openings, there are some move order issues. Not that much as in, in close games, but some, are, some um, move order problems are definitely um, um, yeah, to, to be avoided. Um, and here, key ideas to remember. The f7, f5, lever, Melanux break line b2. I don't even know what that is. So 
Maybe I can learn something here. Malanyuk's break. What is this? Ah, I think it's a5, a4 against b3 here in this in this uh, structure. Yeah. So this is the kind of uh, structure that this book has. Also note how beautifully it is done here. This kind of markers for the pieces. I think it's really a nicely layouted book. It really looks nice. Very. It's a very um. Yeah, very solid production values, let's say. This is the Ponziani opening, right, that we that we got here. Yeah, this is how this uh, this book looks. And um, yeah, oh here, For, here's the fast lane. Line A to B is one of the refutations of the Harvitz attack. Yeah, the Harvitz attack is bishop b5 in the Ponziani. Line B to B offers black a chance to outplay white. Okay, so this is a very brief yeah, summary what happens in the in the upcoming chapters and he shows what lines are the most important to know. That's really good. Yeah, I'm um, I really like this approach. Uh, to be honest, when I'm, I'm working on my book still and I'm in the process of finishing it, my own book, and uh, I had a, a similar idea. I didn't call it the fast lane and so on, but what I'm doing is um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm I'm writing a chapter introduction for everything. Where I will briefly um, try to summarize what lines, um, yeah, how 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 much effort do you have to invest to learn specific lines? And I often also give two possibilities: one that is easier to learn, one is a bit more uh, a, bit, a little bit more work to work to learn. So I have a, a similar idea, but it is done very nicely here with this fast lane, very fast lane approach. So this is how this book, yeah, looks like. It's um, it, it feels like. Yeah, so something of value, very nice. Okay, I will also give you an overview about uh, some of the lines that are presented. And um, of course, I need a chessboard for that. So just bear with me while I put up a board. So we got a board now, so I can give you an overview about the presented repertoire. Yeah, as mentioned, it is not um, the case that he only gives one line against each white option, but rather... Yeah, a selection of ideas and lines to choose from. Um, it's a really big book, so I'm not going to go through everything. The, vi the video should be, yeah, not like an hour or two hours long. Um, if we start with the rare stuff, yeah, in the very rare lines, um, this is all fairly standard. He gives, um, if, we, if we start, there is a center game, this kind of thing. Here he gives both uh, bishop b4, I mean, we start with this, this is kind of normal. To give both this move and bishop e7, they're both fine, and it's a nice selection uh, to have here. Yeah. Um, the Danish gambit, interesting. We go back here. The Danish gambit, which is this. Here he gives two lines, very good that, that he mentioned two lines, because the main line is d5, the, the declined. Um, and this, this often leads to this kind of position, which is surprisingly difficult for black to win. It's a long endgame line, which he also gives, um, leading to equal play, but it's very difficult to win this. However, if you want to play for a win, he gives queen e7, which is a very good move, actually. It wins the e4 pawn, and uh, it looks a little bit strange, but it is strong. It wins this pawn for very little compensation. I actually think that this move order here with d4, c3 is, is incorrect. Black is a pawn up here for basically nothing. Queen e7 is very strong, but he, he gives d5 as the as a solid alternative because you have to know it in a way anyway, because, oops, not this. There is this move order after which d5 is, uh, well, very valid. And uh, here queen e7 does not make much sense. So this is why d5 is an extra option given. Yeah, there is the bishop's opening with bishop c4, after which knight f6 is played. And um, yeah, we have transpositions to this, of course, which maybe is more likely or should be classified as a Vienna game. He gives this line and also knight c6, intending knight a5. So there's a, a huge variety of lines to choose from according to your taste and your, yeah, your idea for this game, let's say. Sometimes you want to be a little bit sharper, sometimes a little bit more solid. Here also, this is nice. He gives both this, which is the total main line, and also knight c6. 
quite interesting that uh, both is mentioned. It, there are some subtle differences here regards to uh, various setups. For example, if white plays g3, this kind of quiet setup, here black has additional options with f5 or h5. Uh, no, not this one. <laughs> that looks strange. Uh, h5. f5, however, is his main idea to play here. Uh, and also, if white intends to play the Vienna with f4, then here you have additional very aggressive options, which he also discusses. So in the in the rare lines, there's this really nice um, overview of lines. Okay, let's go back. The King's Gambit. <laughs> yeah, the King's Gambit. He has two lines against the King's Gambit. And this is really, really important because the King's Gambit is a relatively rare opening. I have gotten it on the board once in 10 years of King's Gambit, and 10 years of E4, E5 is black. And um, if you learn a super sharp line, um, you never get it on the board, and then when you get it, you have forgotten it. So he gives a relatively low maintenance line and a sharp line. This, of course, is the sharp line, and this is also probably the best line against the King's Gambit. Um, he is, however, giving against this old move. It's not giving very interesting. It's not giving bishop g7 like everybody plays nowadays, but even g4 to um, actually accept this peace sacrifice. He, he thinks that this is good for black. Um, yeah, I personally wouldn't play this, <laughs> even if it is good, but just as my personal preference, I don't like to be attacked that much. But if you don't like this kind of super sharp approach, he also gives um, this line, or to, to be more precise, this line, the modern defense to the King's Gambit, which um, is also what I had chosen for my um, E4, E5 repertoire in my video series for the channel. This is the no-nonsense approach. Black just develops normally, and this is something that you can play without um, much theoretical workload. It's the, the, the simple approach. Um, what else? Let's have a look. Rare third moves. After this, what do we have here? The Ponziani. <laughs> Against the Ponziani, he gives two lines. The line that I gave in my, my video series, D5, which is just, um, frankly speaking, probably the best move and leads to an easy game for black, sometimes even an advantage if white is uh, playing uh, bad lines. Or he gives this move, and after d4 the capture, which is very interesting. That's um, a good line to have in your repertoire. Also because there is this gambit line, which I briefly had uh, shown beforehand. I mentioned that this is a good reply, but a little bit uh, boring. And this also gives you this move as an alternative. It's just a funny transposition, the Ponziani and the Goring Gambit here are actually transposing into one another. Um, there's also this Gambit approach here in this um, this overview. And uh, yeah, he gives bishop c5 as good. And uh, yeah, of course, just this. And also knight f6, which transposes to the two knights. Uh, this is not really very dangerous. Um, then the scotch opening, which is really important. Uh, the scotch is one of the one of the the main alternatives to the Rui Lopez, and uh, the good thing is he gives a really a, a boatload of lines, the knight f6 line and the bishop c5 line. Really nice. So both are covered. And um, you can choose from what you like. Very nice. And also, even with sub variations, yeah. Here he's giving in the four knight scotch. He's giving both the classical move and the. Yeah, I'm not sure if you would call it a modern move, but the, the a little bit slightly offbeat move, bishop c5. Very nice that you have uh, both um, both lines covered. Also, what I liked is that after this, this. He gave uh, queen f6, which is, of course, the main line. But he also gave this rare move, which I find interesting. This is slightly related to what I play uh, against the scotch. I have this this funny line. I invert the check, and then I go here. And um, after this, I have to take. And this is quite related. Uh, very interesting coverage here in the book. So it's um, 
I think it's really nice that you have this um, this, this selection of lines. Um, an interesting point is that here, um, I'm sorry, of course not, 95, queen e7, queen e2, 95, c4, that here he um, exclusively gives knight b6. There's also bishop a6, but okay, there you have to cut some things short. Yeah, you cannot show all lines. But knight b6 is of course a good and reliable line. And um, in fact, um, the coverage here in the book um, probably will lead <laughs> to to me uh, looking at this a little bit more and play this as black. I really wanted an alternative to my check all the time so that I at least can vary a little bit. I mean, I know some of that, but not really well. Um, what else is there? The four knights, yeah, the four knights, this opening. He gives some um, interesting things against g3, the Gleck system, both this and d5 is good. And he shows both options. Um, there is the, well, where is it? Yeah, the Spanish four knights. Yeah, this is a slightly annoying opening as black if you want to uh, play for a win because there are many very drawish lines. Knight d4, for example, is a theoretically recommended move, but it has one drawback. White can play this, which leads to a totally dull position. Yeah, there is this, this kind of thing happening where at the end, well, where all knights are traded and it's very symmetrical and boring. And um, yeah, this is this is very good about this book. He's very practical and says, okay, you know, this is good knight d4, but it's only really good um, if you if you want to play for win. Well, knight d4 has a drawback. If white just wants a draw, he can get it with knight x d4 with good play. And he um, presents an alternative that you can play if you really, really, really want to win. And this is bishop d6. <laughs> Looks a little bit strange, I know, but this is in effect a good move. Black wants to castle. Yeah, I give you an example. Something something like that is Black's idea. And then back to F8. This happens quite often in the open games, this this idea. But the bishop is normally coming from c5 or from e7. Bishop d6 is a totally respectable line. I know it looks kind of strange, but it's not that bad. I have played it myself already in cases where I wanted to play for a win. But if this looks too weird to you, he gives bishop b4 as an alternative to play um, in a more yeah harmonious uh, fashion maybe. This is also a little bit uh, dull, but okay, for the people who want to get a fight, bishop d6 is the, the better move. Yeah, uh, a big part of the book, of course, is bishop c4, the Italian game. And um, he gives both knight f6 and bishop c5. And this is really great because Bishop c5 and knight f6 are really somewhat different <laughs> um, in regards to, to various things. For example, after bishop c5, white has the Evans gambit. Not everybody's cup of tea to be confronted with this gambit. But he also has some relatively dull lines like this, where it is not that easy to, to play for a win. Um, he covers all that and black is totally fine. Sometimes it's a little bit boring. And frankly speaking, I also find some lines of the Italian game rather boring, like like this with d3, where white very often goes for a trades and so on. And uh, this is nice that he also covers knight f6 because this is just more aggressive. It puts a question to the four pawn immediately. And well, white has to react to that. He cannot play c3, d4 here anymore. He either has to play d3 now to cover the pawn, except equality, like with this, or knight g5, which leads to gambit play. Man, here he gives the main line, which is the most reliable one. And I think this is the first coverage of this gambit lines for a long time on a, on a decent level. I mean, there, there was some book some years ago about this line, but I mean, if the books are like eight years old, 10 years old, they are mostly not engine checked. And this is, of course, uh, very valuable nowadays that these modern books that are done um, yeah, in a decent way, they are all checked with computers. So especially in sharp positions, um, you can be much more confident that this is technically sound. So um, very nice uh, overview here. He also gives after d3, there's of course the transposition to the Italian, which as mentioned, a little bit dull, but very solid. Um, but also this move, which is nice because um, 
Well, if you want to play for win, sometimes the more passive looking move, bishop e7, is a little bit better even because it avoids trades yeah? after bishop c5, bishop e3, for example. And bishop e7 keeps all pieces on the board. Yeah, It's in, in a way a little bit more of a fighting move. Um, it also has the idea to, to put up something like this in the right move order. I'm not sure if this is a, a correct one, actually. I could look it up. But uh, this is a totally different approach to the bishop c5 Italian game. Yeah, so that um, both options here are covered is very nice. There's also good coverage about those wacky gambit lines that there are. Yeah? This is, for example, is totally fine for black, but you have to, to know what you're doing. Um, he gives interesting things in the Evans gambit, by the way, which I never knew even existed. He gives um, this, for example, bishop a5. And let me look, I have to I have to look this up because I really never saw this before. Um, let me look. Against d4, I think. Let me, let me check this, this is really funny. What is he giving? Uh, isn't this b5? Yes, he gives b5. Yeah? What a crazy move, but it seems to be okay. The Baxter variation, yeah. There are so many, uh, so many forgotten lines in the, the. The idea is that after this, you will take on d4 with the knight, and uh, you had to somehow misplace this bishop first, yeah. I think because of a uh, bishop f7, yeah. If you if you play um, play, take take it back, play this first. White white probably will take here, yeah, and then get this. Have to get the bishop to b5 first. Strange stuff, but. Well, it's really a funny thing. If you look at very old lines, this is probably from the from from 1800 something. Um, sometimes you can dig out those, all those old lines, check them with modern technology, and they are quite often quite quite okay. You only have to refresh it, yeah, get some some new ideas and support some of those old things with new uh, new ideas and analysis. Yeah, a really great book. If you are looking for something uh, about E4, E5 is black, this is the book to get. There are some other uh, decent books um, for black repertoire if white avoids the Royal Lopez, but I think this is really the the best one out there. And the, the really big advantage of this book compared to other E4, E5 repertoire books. Uh, note, don't, there's no Rue Lopez in there, it's just anyth everything else. A big advantage is that you very often get two or three options to choose from. And this is, I think, very valuable. Sometimes uh, an opening book gives you just, just one specific line. And if you happen to dislike it, well, hmm, then you're basically, yeah. Then you need to look for something else. Get another book, analyze yourself. And here at least, I mean, if you don't like, let's say, if he presents two or three options and you don't like any of those, <laughs> then you probably should reconsider if this opening is for you because then it's probably a case that you don't like the, the general structure or whatever. So um, there should be something in there for, for everyone. And it's a good, uh, let's say, compromise between yeah, being comprehensive, yeah, and, and show everything and don't go into too much detail. Should be a good middle of the road approach. You don't need 3000 pages of opening theory, you really don't. It's just uh, something to find the good, a good, good balance, yeah, between, yeah, being complete and show what you need to know. And especially this fast lane approaches is a very, this is very nice. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this overview. Really, a really nice book. I will do some more opening reviews in the next couple of days, one or two at least, because there are some books that I really liked recently. And um, yeah, around Christmas time, maybe you um, still want to want to get yourself um, a present or someone else. <laughs> so um, some book recommendation might come in handy. Yeah, I hope you liked it. I'll be back very soon with new videos. Also some new kibitzing content. Also, I can um, announce that during uh, Christmas time, I will do some live streams. One, two, three, I don't know. I will announce it on the channel. Thanks for watching.